thanks everyone for joining us. We're going to be talking about how Lucene powers uh, the LinkedIn segmentation and targeting platform. A little bit about us. Myself is Heng Lu, and this is Raj. We're both uh, software engineers at LinkedIn. Here's our agenda for today. Uh, just a little bit about inf we're going to talk a little bit about LinkedIn itself. Uh, and an overview of the segmentation and targeting platform, and then Roz will go into detail, much more detail about how we use Lucene in this platform. About LinkedIn, uh, our mission is to connect the world's professional to make it more productive and successful. This not only means helping uh, professionals to find dream jobs, but as well as to make them to be great at what the job they're currently in. Here's a vision, and our most important core value is our members first. Some interesting statistics. Even though it says we had uh, 238 million, but we just passed uh, a quarter of a billion members now. And 65% of our members are now outside the United States. And we actually have an office in Dublin. Um, LinkedIn has been localized over 19 languages. Most of the major companies are using LinkedIn for finding the talents. Uh, we have over 30 million members that uh, represent students and recent graduates. So they represent like the fastest growing demographic on LinkedIn. And recently, we just, there's an announcement today that we just passed uh, 1 million members in Irish members. So that's one out of five Irish that now have a LinkedIn account. Just curious, how many people don't have a LinkedIn account? One. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we are headquartered in Mountain View, California, in the United States, and we have uh, offices all over the world. Right now, we have about 4,200 employees are located around the world. How many people know how, to, how does LinkedIn make money? None. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, we make money from three different product lines, talent solutions. That's what most companies or most uh, enterprises use to find the talents that they need. Uh, that makes up the bulk of the revenues, 56%. And then the second product is marketing solutions that will allow companies to advertise on LinkedIn.com. And the last product is called premium subscriptions that uh, allows someone to pay a little bit of money to have access to all the events features on LinkedIn.com. So that's how we make money. So on to about the segmentation and targeting platform. So from the online marketing's perspective, there's always a need right, to segment members into different buckets based on certain criteria, and then target those members with certain campaigns. That could be an email campaign or so ads targeting campaigns. And these campaigns are typically for either acquiring new paid customers, or to engage with existing customers, or to announce new product lines, or, or trainings, or important news. So in order to do segmentation, um, there has these, these segment criteria basically come from uh, member attributes, right? information about our members. Uh, and they can come from either their professional identities, where they're currently working at, where they went to school, and such. As well as the connection data, their social data, right? their connections, how many of their arts, um, where, who do they follow, and who they endorse, and kind of things like that. As well as the uh, engagement on LinkedIn.com. What do they do when they go to LinkedIn? How many times they've been to LinkedIn.com, and such. So these basically these sets of attributes of our members that can be used to form segmentation. So let's go through a very simple use case. Let's say we're going to create a campaign. We're going to take basic member attributes from, from their professional identities. And then that's what we want to use for targeting criteria. So we add these members' attributes into certain tables. And then we want to create a segment, say. We want all the members that are currently working in California. And they, their professional is engineer, right? So, so once we have that segment of members, then we can use that information to do send out the campaign, email campaigns, or either target them on uh, via advertisement and such. So from the business use cases, it's like this. 
the business or the marketing team or business analytics teams would like to launch these new campaigns often, right? There could be multiple campaigns going on at the same time, in the same week for that matter. And they would like to specify these targeting criteria using arbitrary sets of attributes. Could be five, could be 10, could be three. And they can create new attributes all the time. So that means that these attributes or information about LinkedIn members have to be materialized or computed and stored in a certain place. And we usually store those on either Hadoop or Teradata systems. So based on those business requirements, what we came up with is something uh, called segmentation and targeting platform. That has two components. One is the attribute competition engine, and the other one is the attribute serving engine. So I'm going to go through a little bit more details about each one of these. The attribute computation engine is effectively a self-service uh, application that will allow business folks in the uh, marketing teams or business analytics teams to come in and express the computation logic to, in terms of how to compute these attributes. And the engine will take care of in terms of the complexity of how to, when to execute those uh, computation logic and how to execute them and where to store the result. And of course, the data for these member attributes reside in different locations or different systems. So this engine has to support that. After all the computations are done, then we have to consolidate that data set into a single data set uh, to make it easy for anyone in the company to use or to, anal to further analyze that data set. And then of course, we have to make that data set available on multiple systems uh, for the business folks as well as data scientists to access to those data, either on Hadoop or uh, on our Teradata system. So at a high level, the, the, the attribute computation engines effectively, it's a way to compute these attributes that come from different data sets. Some of them are small, small, some of them are large. So as you can imagine, there's all kinds of interesting challenges along with that. However, the final result of the engine, the computation engine, is to produce this, what I call, LinkedIn member attribute table. Effectively, one record per members. And currently, we have about 440 attributes in this table. With this table, then that is the input into the attribute serving engine, which will allow business people to come in in a self-service manner to, create, to easily create different various segments of our members via you know, some UI drag and drops. Uh, to define their uh, targeting criteria effectively. And those uh, are expressed for you as something called attribute predicate expression. And that's basically an expression that's a Boolean expression that is evaluated true or false based on comparing with the attribute value and the expected value. Once they can do that, they can do segments very, very simply. And from that, they can uh, build lists and stuff like that. So, the attribute serving engine effectively needs to support these operations to count how many members meet certain targeting criteria, how to filter out members that don't meet these criteria, as well as to provide a sum. This is where we put in, uh, we assign like each product has a lifetime values. So we assign a score to each of the LinkedIn members. So this will give us a sense in terms of how much money a particular campaign can bring to LinkedIn. And the last thing is it has to support complex nested expressions, right? So be, uh, and it has to support via conjunctions and disjunctions. So effectively, the core problem that the engine has to serve is, is to support arbitrary complex nested predicate expressions against any of the 440 attributes. And these will come and go in as well, so they're not really static. Uh, so that is basically the core problem that the engine has to solve. And we think that problem is effectively an information retrieval problem. So we use Lucene to help us with that, to solve that challenge. So with that engine, we're now able to answer these questions very, very simply. Who are the job seekers? Right? Who are LinkedIn talent solution prospects in Europe? who are North American recruiters that don't work for competitors. So each of these represent a segment, but we can also combine these segments into a more complex segment as well. 
I'm not sure you can see this, but this is like a, a screenshot of a UI that will allow um, business folks to come in, just drag and drop, and provide uh, complex predicate expressions. So now Raj is going to go into much more details about architectures and how we use Lucene. Thanks, Ian. Um, so now that we've got a basic idea about uh, the segmentation platform, let's let, dig in a little deeper to understand how we use Lucene and how, uh, how Lucene actually powers this segmentation and targeting platform. So what we'll do first is uh, look at the overall architecture, and then we'll go a little bit uh, deeper into the indexing architecture, and uh, we'll look at also the serving architecture. So at LinkedIn, the offline data storage basically has two components. One is a relational database, which is Teradata. It's used for short-term uh, data retention, uh, something like if I need to store uh, tables for six months, I probably am better off putting it in Teradata because you know, query results are much faster. And Hadoop is used for uh, more deep storage. So I can store data for more than a year or probably like two years worth of data and do a little deeper analysis into the data. And the attribute computation engine is a layer on top of this data storage. Uh, it again has two components. One is the attribute comp uh, creation engine. Uh, users basically uh, use this attribute creation engine to define attributes. Uh, they can define attributes as Hive queries or SQL queries or pick scripts. And uh, at this point, uh, the definitions are actually stored in an attribute metastore. Uh, it's important to note that we actually do not materialize these attributes during the attribute creation engine time. Right? The, just the definitions are stored in a, in a MySQL database table. And the attribute materialization engine is the actual component which executes these queries and uh, you know, materializes each of these attributes. And the additional step that it does is basically creates a flattened structure of uh, all the attributes for a member. So basically, it creates a denormalized uh, view of uh, all the attributes for a member. So on top of this is the attribute serving engine. Uh, it again has two components. One is uh, the attribute uh, index indexing component, and the other is the serving engine. So the indexing component reads this flat and denormalized structure and uh, creates Lucene indices on top of, uh, top of this data. Uh, we'll go a little deeper into how we create these Lucene indices in the next couple of slides. And uh, the attribute serving engine, um, it, whatever uh, interactions happen with the Lucene indices, uh, things like getting terms, uh, getting term frequencies, or executing a query and getting counts for those uh, queries, or uh, fetching doc values. All these kind of operations are uh, done by the attribute serving engine. And all of this is exposed to RESTful AP APIs. So which means that uh, any of these clients, like I could run a curl command against it, or I could open up a UI against it. So it's a universal access, right? So let's look at uh, the, the indexing architecture in a little more uh, depth. Uh, the flattened structure that is created by this attribute materialization engine is read by the Hadoop uh, indexer MapReduce job. And it also reads the attribute definitions from the MySQL store. So um, the attribute definitions basically tell the MapReduce job uh, how to create fields. So you could create fields as stored fields. You could just index them, decide not to store it. Or you could actually store the fields as, uh, I mean, create the fields as stock values. So all this information comes from the MySQL attribute store. On the, on the output of the indexer MapReduce, uh, basically are individual shards. And the number of shards is equal to the number of reducers that we uh, set in the MapReduce job. And we also have an additional step, uh, which is the index merger, which basically is an offline job which runs outside the, uh, the grid, the Hadoop grid and uh, merges all these index shards into a more uh, manageable number of shards. The reason we did this is uh, data at LinkedIn is pretty huge, and uh, it's, it's growing at an exponential rate. And what we wanted to do is create as many attributes as possible, uh, as many index shards as possible, and uh, later on combine them using an offline uh, job. Uh, we found this to be more efficient than actually trying to create a huge index, uh, which was like a few, few GBs worth of, like, I mean, a few hundred GBs worth of uh, size. And then uh, the merged shards basically are transferred to the web servers and uh, served through the REST API. The actual code, uh, the mapper is basically an identity mapper. Uh, it takes in the Avro record, outputs the Avro record, 
no, no change in the input and the output. And the reducer basically reads this uh, Avro record, creates fields. Uh, the, it uses the attribute definitions that is read from the MySQL table. And it uses that information to create fields, and then creates a document and adds all these fields. And then wraps it on top of a Lucene document wrapper. The reason we had to write this is we had to make the document uh, writable so that it could actually uh, pass through the reducer. The actual work of creating the index uh, is done by the Lucene output format and the record writer. We had to write a custom uh, output format on the record writer. So this is the this is the place where the actual index writer config is uh, set. It's, it's initialized, and uh, the document is extracted from the Lucene document wrapper. And uh, you know, we create these indexes in the local directories of each of these reducers. We optimize them and then copy it back into HDFS. So each reducer does this on its own data set. So each of them are mutually exclusive data sets. And uh, each reducer creates its own Lucene index. Right? So let's look at the architecture of the serving side. Um, initially, when we started off, we uh, started storing the Lucene queries as it is. Uh, into the MySQL table, and we found that uh, pretty soon we ran into problems like we couldn't decipher what these Lucene queries were when we pulled them back. And uh, we also saw that there was a tight coupling between the UI and the backend. So we actually wanted to create a layer of separation. And what we did is we created a, uh, we, we expressed the, the Lucene queries in terms of JSON predicate expressions. So the entire hierarchy, what uh, the screenshot that he and just showed you, it's, it's represented in a JSON predicate expression, and uh, we had uh, we had a JSON to Lucene query parser that we wrote that would convert this JSON expression into a Lucene query, and then that is run against the inverted index. The main advantage with this this kind of separation is that uh, later on, if we decide to move away from Lucene for some other solution, uh, it's very easy for us to for us to scale, all we have to do is basically write a query parser which would convert the JSON expression into the query, right? And uh, let's next look at the load balanced model. This is the current uh, model that is in production. So the HTTP request comes in and it hits a load balancer, which is, uh, which is a very basic hardware load balancing system. It does a round robin and passes the request to the individual web server, and the web server <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. And the web server runs these uh, queries against the shards that are there in the shared shared drive. So it's important to note here that each web server has a complete view of all the indices. So if there are like 20 partitions that you're running these queries against, each web server has the complete view of all these 20 reducers, 20 20 shards. So we what we did is we basically opened multi multi reader on top of these all these partitions and then expose an index searcher on top of this. Right? So there are several uh, drawbacks with this model. We soon realized that the number of shards, uh, when it hits a limit, the system performance goes down. And there's also a single point of failure here, which is the shared drive. If the shared drive goes down, the entire application is down. So what we did is, in addition to load balancing, we also wanted to do distribution and failover. And that's what uh, we, we are currently prototyping. And uh, for this, we used a software called Helix, which was written at LinkedIn and open sourced. And uh, it's currently an Apache incubator project. Uh, Helix is basically a generic <coughs> cluster management framework. Um, and it uh, manages partitioned and replicated resources in distributed systems. Uh, here, the replicated resources are basically the index shards, which are replicated across multiple nodes. And, uh, and it's also partitioned, naturally. And it's built on top of Zookeeper. It hides all the Zookeeper primitive complexities. And it also provides distributed features like two-phase commit and leader election. So in case a node goes down, which is a leader, it, also, it automatically uh, uh, it creates a, it, it, it elects a different leader, right? And uh, if you want more information about Helix, you could go to helix.incubator.apache.org. So now this is how the model looks uh, after we introduce Helix into the into the stack. Uh, the HTTP request comes in, and we still have the load balancer there. Uh, the reason is that at some point, if we want to distribute it across multiple Helix clusters, we could uh, you know we could route these uh, queries based on based on the QPS, right? Or maybe just a basic round robin. 
and it hits the Helix cluster. And what we did is basically wrote a component which does the scatter gather within the Helix cluster. So that interfaces with the Helix cluster to 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 find out what nodes are uh, not which nodes are active, and then scatters these queries queries into each individual active uh, active nodes. And you can see that uh, each web server now has only uh, it's it's serving only one shard as compared to all the shards which which initially uh, it had to read. So this had a couple of advantages. The performance was uh, exponentially better. And the other thing is when there is a failover, let's say web server 3 went down, uh, it could automatically switch over to, to the web server 2 to uh, serve the index, index shard 3. Right? So uh, we've prototyped this, and we are already seeing a considerable increase in performance, uh, especially with queries like uh, is null and is not null, which we had to scan through all the documents first and uh, basically filter out wherever the, uh, wherever the values were set and not set. Right. So next, uh, let's look at doc values. Uh, we actually wanted to dedicate a section to doc values because uh, one of the use cases required us to fetch values as a post process and uh, doc values has actually worked out pretty well for us and it's, uh, it's made the application very lightweight and at the same time increasing efficiency of the post process. So the use cases, uh, once the segments are built, the users basically want to forecast. Uh, th that is, they want to understand what is the total worth, uh, that worth of the campaign that they are running, uh, what is the revenue, the projected revenue that, that the campaign would fetch. And uh, campaigns can run various revenue models, which means that no, there is no definite set of, uh, separate, uh, there is no single uh, revenue model that, that we could use to generalize these, uh, uh, these projections. And uh, this involved adding per member propensity scores and uh, dollar amounts. So the propensity scores are user generated. It's not generated by the system itself. It's uh, generated by the user and it's per member. So we had to actually store uh, actual value against each of these members. So why didn't we take the traditional approach and put it in a stored field? Uh, stored fields actually have a level of uh, indirection per document, which means that for every every uh, document, it has to do a two-disk seek operation. And when you're actually iterating through a million through millions of documents, this, this cost adds up pretty quickly. And uh, we also didn't use field caches. The reason is that it's it's a mem it's a memory resident data structure. And uh, when you when you're actually dealing with millions of uninverted values, uh, your your memory memory grows up pretty fast. It, it works very well when there's like enough memory in the machine, but uh, each machine cannot have indefinite amount of uh, memory, right? It's, it's bound by the, the, by the RAM size. And uh, there's also an additional cost to parse these values, so they do not by nature uh, support the data types that we're actually trying to put in. So a lot of these propensity scores and dollar amounts are doubles or floats, and we actually wanted to uh, keep the data type as it, uh, uh, the data type of the field as it is. And that is where doc values actually worked out really well for us. And doc values are basically just uh, dense column storage. And uh, it, it actually has one value per document and one, uh, one, va one column per field and segment. You could, you could think of it like a data grid, if, if that makes you uh, imagine this better. And it accepts primitives. So we stored these values as doubles. Uh, all the propensity scores are stored as doubles. And there's no conversion needed from and to string. And it loads up 80 to 100 times faster than a field cache uh, because it's all in memory and I mean it, it's all in a disk and then it's, it takes very little time to store uh, into load, to load it into a cache. And all the work is done during indexing. So at serving time, things are really, really fast. And doc value fields also can be indexed and stored, which adds to the flexibility of our indexing. Right? So this, this is in production and it, it, it's worked out really well for us, it's, uh, the, uh, the application has become very lightweight, and uh, queries have, uh, we get answers to queries much, much faster than stored fields or field caches. So we also wanted to share some of the lessons learned. Uh, first, looking at the indexing side, uh, we try to reuse as many, uh, we just try to reuse one index writer per reducer, uh, so it depends on number of reducers you have for each shard that we create. We try to reuse the index writer and field and document instances. The reason is that it saves you a considerable amount of uh, uh, GC cost. 
and it also increases your indexing efficiency. And the other use case is that we wanted to create as many partitions as possible, like I explained a little, little while ago. And uh, we also wanted to take this offline and merge it into, uh, into a more manageable number of shards. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, some, of these, uh, some of the machines that where the Hadoop task is running, they're not very robust. They do not have uh, more than like a GB of uh, RAM. So what we wanted to do is basically create as many small partitions as possible, optimize them, download them into a different machine, and then merge them using these uh, Lucene, AP Lucene APIs. It's actually worked out pretty well. Uh, even though it sounds like it might be, a very, might be a little inefficient process, it's actually worked out pretty well for us. And uh, we, we actually rebuild the entire index. Uh, the reason being uh, all the attributes are managed by the user. So user decides what attributes to add, what, what attributes to modify and delete. Uh, when that's the case, it's very hard to enforce a high watermark. And uh, it's almost impossible for us, to un for us to decide what changed and what did not change. So what we had to do is basically take the entire data set and bootstrap it each time we had to refresh the data. And partial updates was, uh, was considered, but then it had several disadvantages that in Lucene we had to basically get the document out, uh, delete the fields that we didn't want, and modify certain fields in the sense like we had to delete the field, add a new field uh, with, a, with a new value, and uh, then index it back into the, into the, in the, into the index. Um, this actually was a little troublesome because we had several fields which were one too many, uh, which had a one too many relationship. So we actually didn't know which, which value to get out of this one to many and go replace them. So some of these considerations basically m made us very wary of the partial updates. Uh, even, even efficiency wise, we didn't see a great performance uh, gain by just, doing modi just by modifying these values within the index. And uh, always analyze the index. Uh, for, us, one, for us, we actually gained a, lot of, uh, gained a lot by actually looking at the indexes. And we saw that a lot of these fields are stored, whereas we were not actually retrieving these values as a post process. So uh, what we did is we just indexed them. We did not store them. And the same with term frequencies and term positions. And some of these uh, norms also. We omitted certain norms. We saw that the index, index size decreased considerably. On the serving side, uh, reuse a single instance of index searcher. It again saves GC cost. And in addition to that, Lucene natively caches a lot of these uh, queries. And each time you open an index searcher, it basically, you don't want to incur the cost of caching this again and again. Right? And uh, limit the use of stored fields and term vectors. It makes your queries run faster just because the index, index size is smaller. And always plan for load balancing and failover. Uh, this we talked about just, just a while back. And cache term frequencies. Uh, this is an interesting use case for us. Um, some of the fields where the cardinality of the values is pretty huge. Uh, let's say example is a group. Uh, example is groups. So LinkedIn groups could run into a few millions. So when you have to actually fetch these values and uh, fetch the term frequencies along with it, uh, we didn't want to run it run it at real time against the index. The latency is increased uh, as the cardinality of these values increased. So what we did is we actually stored these terms and term frequencies in an external data structure, in-memory data structure, and served, served requests to term, get terms and term frequencies against that. And uh, always use different machines for serving and indexing. In our case, we, it's a MapReduce job which creates these indices, so we were actually better off. But if you're, if you're actually <coughs> planning to uh, serve and index in the same machine, Indexing is a pretty CPU, CPU bound, and it's also I/O bound. So you don't want to you don't want to slow down your uh, serving because it's doing something in the indexing side. So uh, next, let, let's look at why we didn't use some of these existing solutions and why we actually went into native Lucene and implemented this. Uh, for us, the use case was just not about serving. Uh, we had we have like multiple applications which could be run independently. The first problem was to standardize all these attribute definitions. Second thing is to materialize. And then third is the serving engine. So, <coughs> so all the, the, the schema basically changed very dynamically. Uh, the reason is that attributes change very dynamically. Right? So what attributes are there at any point of time, it's, it's, a very, uh, you know, it's, it's completely based on the user. So users could just experimentally run a few, few attributes and decide to go back and delete it the next day. So, what we wanted to do is keep this keep keep the schema outside of the serving layer, so we kept it in a MySQL uh, table, 
and that actually worked out to be pretty uh, pretty flexible for us and uh, since these indexes are also bootstrap uh, in hadoop we we didn't uh, even though it was not impossible we found it pretty hard to transfer these indices into a solar or elastic search cluster and make it work so having said all this we haven't ruled out solar or uh, elastic search in fact we are going into the next phase where we are seeing that the data is exploding exponentially so what we want to do is go and do a little more case study on each of these uh, solutions and then come up with a more fitting footing uh, solution for the back end and in addition to these two solutions we also have a homegrown uh, project called search as a service that is being done uh, done at linkedin which again uses helix to manage the cluster the added advantage is that the cluster is actually maintained by by a team and you get uh, sre support plus you know you don't have to maintain this infrastructure all you have to do is point the point the data to the cluster it creates indices and then it opens up apis for you to access the access the data so that's coming up and uh, we are going to do a case study and decide on which is the best backend and that's our next step yeah with that uh, that's the last slide we have and we wanted to thank uh, thank you all on behalf of linkedin for uh, coming to the stock and uh, hope we were able to portray some use cases and uh, you know uh, the solutions that we had and hope you guys had some take away from all this if you have any questions right now yeah we would be happy to answer them uh for us the primary reason was we wanted to create a layer of uh, separation right and uh, we started off storing these lucene queries uh, just just for everybody else's sake the the, re uh, the question was why what was the additional benefit apart from creating a layer of separation using the json predicate expressions um yeah so the primary reason was just just to create the layer of separation and uh, if you actually tried storing these lucene queries you would understand the pain behind deciphering what 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 the actual uh, query meant um so that was one other reason we wanted to express this in a more generic way and that and the most the first thing that came to our mind is json and it was actually very easy for us to express these uh, uh, this boolean exp boolean predicates uh in you know in a very uh, easy to read manner so that was one of the reasons why we used that just to add to raj point is uh with the json structure it's fairly easily to re-represent that on the ui side rather than the query in the, the lucene's format cool thanks okay. for your time thank you